Yes, uh, welcome my dear friends. Today we will discuss the second question on modern Indian history. So today's topic for the discussion is evaluate the positive and uh, negative impact of British East India Company rule in India. Okay, so that is the question I am going to discuss with you today. As you all know, the East India Company ruled this country for almost 100 years. To be exact, they started ruling from the Regulating Act 1773 and it went on till 1857, that is the Sepoy Mutiny. And after that, the East India Company <coughs> rule ended and uh, the British government directly started ruling this country under the act known as the 1858 act and uh, Queen Victoria's uh, declaration you are all aware of that which is uh, popularly known as the Magna Carta for the people of India as uh, Lord Canning described it so now today's discussion focus around two things what all the things happened between 1773 to 1857 that's what we call in general as the East India Company rule or simply you can also call it as the company rule in India and now the question to be answered is what is the positive impact and the negative impact on India during this British rule and as the question goes, first you have to make up your mind what is the positive impact of the British rule in India? Politically, what was the impact? Economically, what was the impact? Socially, what was the impact? Culturally, what was the impact? Administratively, what is the impact? So we are going to analyze it from multiple dimensions not from a single dimension from multiple dimension you have to answer the question now first for your convenience how you can collect the points quickly because you are already preparing for the means and you are aware of that already totally 23 governor generals ruled India you know that total number of uh, uh, rulers or 23 governor generals ruled India between 1773 to 1857 and uh, the person who started the rule in India was uh, Warren Hastings the first governor of Bengal Lord uh, Warren Hastings and the last one to come is uh, Lord Canning who was the governor general and during the time of Lord Canning only the Sipai mutiny took place in 1857 also known as the first war of India's independence now to answer the question that I asked you what is the British impact positive impact you need to focus on three people who are important from their <coughs> contribution uh, regarding the positive impact on India and who are those three people whom you have to take into consideration is one is Lord Cornwallis the first one you have to analyze is Lord Cornwallis then comes Lord William Bentinck and then comes Lord Dalhousie these three people you have to highlight in your answer because during their time lot of good things happened in India and here deliberately I am not uh, making reference uh, uh, for one fellow who did not contribute anything for the developmental aspect or administrative aspect in India that is uh, Lord Wellesley so I am purposely avoiding Lord Wellesley because during his time no improvements changes took place in the administration because his only focus was on military aspects as was the one who introduced subsidiary <coughs> alliance system and he was too preoccupied with wars with uh, Tipu Sultan, the Tiger of Mysore and of course Bajirao II, the Peshwa ruler 
in the Second Anglo-Maratha War, which ended in the Treaty of Basin in 1804. We are all aware of that, but we are not going to discuss about uh, Lord Wellesley, as he is in no way connected with uh, administrative or political changes in the country. So my discussion will focus around these three people, Lord Cornwallis and uh, Lord Bentinck and Lord Dalhousie. So during their time, some important positive things happened in the country, which you can sum up as the positive impact of the British rule in India. Now what are those things? I will tell you one by one and you can uh, note it down also. First we will have to concentrate on Lord Cornwallis. Lord Cornwallis as Governor, Governor General of Bengal, what changes was done in the administration and Cornwallis was in India uh, during the time frame of 1786 to 1793. 1786 to 93, that is the time frame of Cornwallis. <clears throat> now, what is a good thing that happened during the time of Cornwallis is under the caption of permanent land settlement in Bengal. You know that he was famous for permanent land settlement in Bengal. As a result, what good thing happened in India is for the first time the land records in India, you know, they got streamlined. Earlier, the land record system in the country was very archaic, haphazard, not systematic. But after he introduced permanent land settlement in India, the land survey system and land record system, you know, they get streamlined. I mean, a scientific maintenance of the records was done. And the revenue administration in India came to a systematic pattern. It's called making the Diwani system work in a proper way. Diwani means imposition of tax and collection of tax. So that Diwani administration was streamlined and Jamindars, landlords in the villages, they were made responsible for the collection of revenue and in turn they have to return it to the British East India Company after taking their share that is 1 by 10 of the collected revenue which you are all aware under the permanent land settle settlement system. So one important advantage that happened in India was the revenue department got systematically well established. The collection of taxation system in the country became streamlined and above all <coughs> the maintenance of land records you know it became <coughs> streamlined the land record system which was in a total confusion state you know it became uh, streamlined and even today <coughs> whenever you go to uh, village uh, rural India if there is any lacunae or confusion regarding the ownership of the land even now we go back to the records in the archives department and go for the records of Cornwallis to establish who is the owner of the land the ownership of the land you know it got streamlined and properly established under the law during the time of Cornwallis so one contribution of Cornwallis to India is strengthening streamlining the revenue administration, particularly land record system. This is the first point you have to note under Cornwallis. Now I will take you to second point, that is Cornwallis is known as judicial reforms, father of judicial reforms and lot of changes he did in the Indian judicial system, particularly as you are all aware. He is known for introducing the Code of Cornwallis. It is known as the Code of Cornwallis, which is nothing but separation of the judiciary from the executive. Executive should not interfere or influence the working of judiciary and that is the most important contribution of Cornwallis to Indian judiciary, especially 
judicial independence. The autonomy of the judiciary was ensured during his time and even today, even today it is recognized as the Cornwallis Court. Even today we recognize it as the Code of Cornwallis which clearly says, which clearly says that uh, judiciary uh, should be separated from executive and its importance is so much that when Ambedkar drafted the constitution, he took this point and incorporated in the Indian constitution under Article 50, Directive Principle of State Policy. So Article 50 says judiciary shall be separated from executive and we openly call Article 50 as a Cornwallis article. Even now it is famous as Cornwallis article because you have to maintain the independence and impartiality of the judiciary. So this is a very important contribution by Cornwallis uh, in the first point. And uh, subsequently you should also note what other changes were brought by Cornwallis. It was Cornwallis who started bringing in uniformity in the judicial system. Because otherwise in India the judiciary was in a different way. Each province was uh, following its own judicial system like the Nijam of Hyderabad. The Peshwas were having their own system. Our Vodiyas of Mysore, they were having their own judicial system. So each Maharaja, Nawab, Nijam, they were having their own judicial system. But it was Cornwallis who said that all these people should come under common umbrella. It's called common umbrella under which everyone has to follow the similar uh, judicial uh, system. And in the later 80 years, not during the time of Cornwallis, during the time of Lord Benting, it led to the formation of the courts. It is called codification of law, which was actually initiated by uh, Lord Cornwallis, but it uh, came to a logical conclusion during the time of uh, Lord William Benting who appointed an expert to do this and I hope all of you know who is that uh, law expert Lord Macaulay. So it was Lord Macaulay who drafted your CPC, Civil Procedure Court, CRPC, Criminal Procedure Court, IPC, Indian Penal Court. All these things were drafted during the time of Lord Benting and the mastermind uh, was uh, Lord Macaulay is called as the father of Indian law courts. Lord Macaulay was the executive member in the executive council of Lord Benting. So what I have to write there in the exam is when we are talking about Cornwallis, his contribution to judiciary is really significant. And even today, <coughs> we are grateful for Cornwallis for his uh, judicial reforms. And even he started circuit courts. The concept of circuit courts was inaugurated by him. The idea of court of appeal, the idea of provincial court. You know, all these things were started by Cornwallis, which is a very big contribution to the evolution of judiciary in India. And what he called as the courts of appeal, today we are calling them as district courts. Today they are called district courts. What he called as the provincial courts, today we call them as high courts. Today we call them high courts. During British time they were called provincial courts. And Lord Cornwallis also uh, did very important thing. The powers of the district collector were bifurcated, segregated. Earlier the DC was taking care of both executive powers and judicial powers. He was both magisterial powers as well as uh, administrative head of the district. But it was Cornwallis who said that now onwards the DC should exercise only administrative powers. And the judicial powers of the deputy commissioner, they were shifted to a newly created post. And that post is called a district judge. Today what we call as a district judge that was started by Cornwallis under the judicial reforms and today district judge is different, DC is different and DC will take care of only executive part 
and you will not deal with any judicial aspects and uh, district judge and district court were created to handle the judicial matters so this uh, segregation bifurcation of the executive and judiciary at the district level of administration itself is a great contribution of cornwallis and it is a positive impact you can call it as positive impact on india okay this is one thing and uh, the third point which i have to note is cornwallis is also called as father of civil service in india i hope you are all aware of that the concept of civil service was started during the time of lord cornwallis of course there was one uh, technical word which uh, you are all aware of it it's called covenanted civil service it is called as covenanted c o v e n a n t e d covenant means contract covenanted civil service means contract based civil service that was started first time in india by cornwallis and you know what is its impact after he started the contract based civil service many of our educated unemployed indians i repeat educated unemployed indians who were in the uh, towns and cities they slowly started joining the uh, east india company service because they were not interested to go back to villages and do agriculture and all that so they were interested in getting white collar job and even today we call it as white collar job and it was cornwallis who introduced the system of white collar job in india and many of the indian youths thousands of indian youths they started joining uh, in the service of british east india company so in the long run i don't say exactly in the cornwallis time in the long run it led to the evolution of civil service in india in the long run it paved the way for evolution of civil service in india and subsequently many other people improved upon it for example during the time of uh, lord william benting there was a charter act charter act of 1833 under which indians were allowed to write an written test in india and indians were first time allowed to become officers under the east india company so indians can become officers in the east india company under the charter act of 18 33 which comes during the time of lord benting so it is one step development further advance in the growth of uh, indian civil service and later on when lord dalhousie comes uh, the, uh, the act itself was changed as uh, the ics act indian civil service act in 1853 so in 1853 the concept of indian civil service was formally introduced in india and the first competitive exam was held in india in 1853 and later on and later on after we got independence that ics was changed into ias indian administrative service so why i told these things for you people is when you are writing the answer you must make this point clear that it is cornwallis who laid the foundation of civil service in india and even historians like bipin chandra and rc majumdar they acknowledge that he can be called as the father of civil service in india cornwallis is called father of civil service in india and one more dimension also you can include in the answer what is that after the civil service was started in the urban india towns and cities there was a growth of a new class in the society it is called the emergence of the middle class the emergence of the middle class is a very very important point in the growth of our society and uh, a famous sociologist professor m n shrinivas i think you have heard about him and you, some of you might have even read his famous book westernization and urbanization in india title of the book westernization and urbanization in india by uh, dr m n shrinivas in that book 
Dr. Srinivas says, it is during the time of Cornwallis that the middle class started coming up. The birth of the middle class started only in the time of Cornwallis. Before Cornwallis, there was no middle class in India. And you know, we were depending on the Varna system, caste system. So our society was divided into Brahman, Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, Shudras, like that. But now, be due to the impact of the Cornwallis rule, our society slowly started shifting from caste system to class system. This is a very important point. You have to write in the answer. And I repeat the point. Uh, please note it down. Indian society started shifting from caste system to class system. Because caste system is a social based system based on the birth of the person. But the class system is based on economic criterion. Class is an economic concept, not a social concept. And even now we have that uh, segregation, uh, that is the stratification, like high class, middle class, low class. Even today we say in the urban India context that high class, middle class, low class. So this concept of middle class actually started growing in India during the time of Cornwallis. So in a way, how you can write the answer? The growth of the middle class, the growth of the middle class or the birth of the middle class is the contribution of Cornwallis. And I will add a very important point now. It is the same middle class which uh, starts growing up during his time. Later on, in the freedom movement, the same middle class is going to play a very important role. This is a very important point you have to mention in the answer. The middle class which was created by Cornwallis in the later part of our history, especially the starting of Indian National Congress, 1885. After the Congress was started, it is these middle class Indians who started joining the freedom movement. In fact, our Indian National Movement is guided by these middle class Indians only. And I can give some names. People like Arvindo Ghosh, people like Surendranath Banerjee, Umesh Chandra Banerjee, Dr. R.C. Dutt, Ramesh Chandra Dutt, and many others, and many others, they were all coming from the middle class only. They were not rich, they were from the middle class and it is these middle class intellectuals who started joining the Indian National Congress. Maybe some of them were moderates and some of them were extremists, but they were all coming from the middle class. And I quote the words from Bipin Chandra's book, the Bhavan Chandra says, the major, the main backbone of the Indian national movement was the middle class intelligentsia, he says. The middle class intelligentsia was at the backbone of the Indian national movement. And my question is, who created this middle class? Who created the middle class? Answer is Cornwallis. It is during the Cornwallis time that the middle class started emerging in urban India, whether it is Calcutta or Bombay or Madras or some suburban centers, cities, towns and cities. So in this way, now I will give a uh, summary of that. During the time of Cornwallis only, all these positive things happened. And you can directly attribute that Cornwallis was responsible for all these things. Whether it is civil service or land record system, or judicial reforms in India, all these go in the, in the credit of uh, Cornwallis and even today we are indebted to Cornwallis. Even today, whoever talks about judiciary, whoever talks about civil service, whoever talks about land revenue administration, the first name we remember and recall is Cornwallis. So this is the first analysis which I gave you regarding the positive impact of the British rule in India is from the point of view of Cornwallis. Okay? Now, now the topic changes. You can make a next page and uh, change the title. What happened during the time of 
లార్డ్ విలియం బెంటింక్ యూ నోట్ డౌన్ లార్డ్ విలియం బెంటింగ్ సో డ్యూరింగ్ ద టైమ్ ఆఫ్ లార్డ్ విలియం బెంటింగ్ లార్డ్ ఆఫ్ గుడ్ థింగ్స్ హ్యాపన్ and i hope all of you know what is those uh, good things happened during his time number 1 lord bentinck is called father of social reforms in india bentinck is called the father of social reforms in india especially one act that he passed you have to highlight it in the answer abolition of sati act abolition of sati act 1829 1829 abolition of sati act was one of the important contribution of lord bentinck because sati system was a social evil practiced in india for centuries and people were following these things blindly in the name of religion in the name of religion in the name of manusmriti in the name of yagnavalka smriti parashara smriti and all that people were following some unwanted Uh, barbaric practices but our leaders wanted to remove these anomalies in the society and here three names you have to mention in the answer one is raja ram mohan roy raja ram mohan roy the founder of uh, what's called uh, the brahma samaj brahma samaj in calcutta and he is also called as the father of modern india is called father of modern india raja ram mohan roy the second great leader was ishwar chandra vidyasagar pandit ishwar chandra vidyasagar who was uh, fighting for the removal of uh, widow system his uh, focus was uh, on the widow system he said that widow system should be stopped and uh, hindu widow should be allowed for remarriage a hindu widow should be allowed for remarriage and she should not suffer throughout her life just because she has become a widow so even he joined the social reforms uh, at that particular time only and one retired judge of the bombay high court i hope you are all aware uh, what is his name justice m g ranade mahadev gobind ranade popularly called as m g ranade Uh, who was also founder of pune sarvajanik sabha the founder of pune sarvajanik sabha 1867 in pune was also one of this uh, group who were interested in social reforms so all these three people they convinced and requested lord bentinck that you please bring in some social reforms and at the request and the interest initiative taken by these three people finally the abolition of sati act was passed by lord bentinck and even today we consider that act as the first social reform in india especially legally in terms of law the practice of sati was declared as a cognizable offence so this is one important thing which you have to highlight as a contribution of lord bentinck in improving the indian society in modernizing the indian society and i would like to quote the lines from bipin chandra the winds of change started blowing across the indian subcontinent i repeat the statement note it in inverted comma the winds of change started blowing across the <coughs> indian subcontinent and credit must be given for lord uh, william bentinck along with our own people our own people were also there and uh, don't forget them and you please mention in your answer raja ram mohan roy ishwar chandra vidya sagar and mg ranade this is one thing the second thing under uh, lord william bentinck is introduction of english this is a very very important point which you have to write in the answer why normally many of us think that introduction of english in what way it helped us because normally what the students will understand is english is just a language sir what impact it will may make on us but not like that you are mistaken i will tell you what impact it made english is not just a means of communication 
don't think that english is just a means of communication for talking not like that but what is the role of english english is called as the carrier of culture english is a carrier of culture the culture of a race of a population is a carried from one generation to next generation through the medium of language only and here i would like to give the quotation of dr r c majumdar a famous historian dr r c majumdar says and you can note the quotation you can note down that quotation two e's changed the destiny of india two e's <coughs> right e in capital e should be in capital two e's changed the destiny of india means what what are the two e's one is e for english first one is e for english second is e for engine engine means a railway engine okay that railway engine will come for later during the time of lord dalhousie when dalhousie comes railway uh, things will start in india so first e is english second e is railway engine so i hope now you understood its meaning two e's changed the destiny of india so the destiny of india completely changed with the introduction of english language by lord william bentinck and of course you have already studied and you are aware of that who gave this idea to uh, lord bentinck it was not the original idea of bentinck it was the idea of lord macaulay and lord macaulay was law member in the executive council of the vice uh, of the governor general so macaulay suggested that if you introduce english language we can easily rule india we can capture india and we can convert indians into british culture and i will give the quotation of lord macaulay himself and you can note down the quotation of lord macaulay what he says the introduction of english language the introduction of english language will enslave indians will enslave indians into cultural slavery will enslave indians into cultural slavery these are the words of lord macaulay means what by learning english language don't think that we are just learning alphabets a b c d but we are also following the british culture we we not only learn the english language but we also learn the british culture english culture european culture our lifestyle changed our social life changed our food pattern changed our dressing pattern changed our festivals and other things changed so the entire cultural lifestyle of indians underwent a drastic change with the introduction of english and here i will give one more very important quotation for your answer that is given by mahatma gandhi ji so mahatma gandhi ji said in 1947 i quote the words of the mahatma and note it in inverted comma britishers have left india but not the british culture britishers have left india but not the british culture means what the introduction of english language led to the spread of western culture british culture in india not only we learn the language but we also imitating aping the western culture and even today i hope you all know about it we are following the same western culture we are, we are all following the same western culture even now in 2022 also we are no we are not we are not following indian culture we are following the british culture that is why another historian dr r c majumdar says what was the impact of uh, uh, lord bentinck on india means he just uh, tells it in one single word he tells it in one single word and what r c majumdar says bharat became india you note it 
Bharat became India during the time of uh, Lord Benting. So here what is the meaning? Bharat means our traditional past, traditional Vedic Bharat of the Vedic time, Indus Valley period, Vedic early Vedic, post Vedic and all that. But India means it is a modern concept. India is a western concept. When I say India, you remember British. When I say Bharat, you remember our ancient glorious past. So, the impact of Lord Bentinck on India was very, very terrible. Very, very terrible because the social impact was so powerful that our people started following the western culture, the western food, the western lifestyle, even western thinking. Our thinking also changed drastically and we started thinking on the British style or on the British pattern, not on our uh, native or indigenous uh, thing. So this is a very important impact or contribution of Lord Benting as far as our social and cultural life is concerned. Underline our social and cultural th things changed drastically uh, with the introduction of English. And another important point which I should also make reference now only is it is the introduction of English language which actually led to our freedom struggle. Our national movement, our freedom movement, it all started with the introduction of English language. Suppose if English was not introduced in India, then perhaps our freedom movement would have been delayed by at least another 50 years, at least by another half a century. Maybe we would not have got freedom in 1947, we would have got by 2000 or something. It would have been dragged on. But because the Britishers introduced the English language, especially Lord Benting introduced English language, our most of the educated middle class Indians, you know, they started learning the western system of education. The western philosophy, western science, western technology, Western humanities, Western political theories, Western literature, everything we started studying and as a result, as a result, Indians started thinking about democracy. We started thinking about justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, fundamental rights, right? Justice, all these concepts, we, we, we borrowed it uh, from the Britishers after we were exposed to English education. And to give you a, another very concrete example, most of our uh, leaders in the first phase, you know what is the first phase? Moderates. Most of our moderate leaders of the Indian National Congress, they were all products of English education. You underline that point. They were all the direct products of English education in India which was introduced by Lord Benting. Whether it is Dada Bhai Navroji, grand old man of India, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, the guru of Gandhiji, the mentor of Gandhiji, Surendranath Banerjee, the first bureaucrat, the first Indian bureaucrat who joined the ICS, SN Banerjee, then Omesh Chandra Banerjee, the first president of the Indian National Congress in 1885 in the Bombay session, or R.C. Dutt, Dr. Ramesh Chandra Dutt, the economist who wrote the book Economic History of India, R.C. Dutt, then Subramanya Mayer, the founder of Hindu paper, Subramanya Mayer, the founder of Hindu paper, 1878 in Madras. So all these, even one more name I can remember, uh, Dr. Badaruddin Tabji, Dr. Baduruddin Tabji in Madras, who started the first Urdu paper called Al Hilal. He was the editor of the first Urdu paper, Al Hilal. A L H I L A L. Al Hilal. And he is the first Muslim to preside over the Indian National Congress in the Madras session. Dr. Baduruddin Tabji presided over the Madras session. And he is the first Muslim to preside over the Congress. 
So why I told all these names is just to make the point clear for you. All these moderate leaders, they were all the products of English education only. They had been to England. They had been to Oxford University. They had been to Cambridge University. They got their education in England. And after getting that education only, they came back and started the freedom movement. Even Jawaharlal Nehru, Motilal Nehru, Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi ji was also a product of English education. They, all these people had been to England and they were exposed to Western uh, uh, literature, Western science, Western philosophy, Western political theories. After they were exposed to the Oxford University thinking, later on they joined the freedom movement. Later on they joined the freedom movement. So, when you are writing the answer, this becomes very very important. If Lord Bentinck had not introduced English, then perhaps our freedom movement, our national movement would have been different and these leaders would not have got uh, so easily because they were not exposed to the Western thought, Western philosophy if English was not uh, introduced. So, in this way, to conclude, what you have to understand is the contribution of Lord William Bentinck is very great. It is very great and it led to the rise of the freedom movement later in 1885. Not exactly in his time, but later in 1885, the freedom movement started in India directly because of the impact of English education on our country. Right? So this is what you have to write under Lord William Bentinck. Now I will come to the last, last leg of the discussion. One more person I have to discuss with you. That is Lord Dalhousie. Now you make the title Lord Dalhousie. So what is the contribution of Dalhousie uh, to India? And you know that Dalhousie was in India between 1848 to 1856. 1848 to 1856, that is the time frame of Dalhousie. And why Dalhousie is remembered for a long time in India is, I quote the words of Bipin Chandra, he is called father of infrastructure in India. Dalhousie is known as the father of infrastructure in India. Today, whoever is talking about the infrastructure, first name we will recall is uh, Lord Dalhousie because he started three departments in the same year in 1853 he started three departments number one the department of railways number one the department of railways number two the department of post and telegraph post and telegraph number three PWD public works department so, three departments were created by Dalhousie alone in 1853 and because of that, today you have the railway network in the country. Today, what we talk about railway network in India, we are indebted, grateful to Lord Dalhousie. No doubt about it. And the first train moved from Bombay to Thane. The first locomotive train ran between Bombay to Thane you know all those details, 1853. And Dalhousie gave importance for the construction of roads, bridges, government buildings. Roads, bridges, government buildings were constructed by Dalhousie, who was a great builder. Dalhousie is a great builder, no doubt about it. Almost today, 50% of the government buildings we see in India they were built during the time of Dalhousie. Almost 50% of the buildings were built during the time of Dalhousie. Whether it is the government office, DC office, or a district court, or a district hospital, whatever, any government building for that matter, they were all built during his time. And it is a long-term asset. These buildings are long-term assets. And also, Another uh, significant point you should remember is he built the first highway. Dalhousie built the first highway 
and it is called the grand trunk road gtr grand trunk road from kolkata to amritsar from kolkata to amritsar the first grand trunk road was built by uh, dalhousie and even today that uh, highway is in use even now we are using that uh, highway grand trunk road so and even he built canals he built dams irrigation projects he started dams he constructed canals he uh, constructed for irrigation purpose each one of them is a contribution of dalhousie and we cannot deny definitely we cannot deny and today we talk about uh, railways as the largest public sector undertaking in asia providing 17 lakh people employment and all that but we should remember dalhousie who started the railways in fact historians call him as father of railways in india father of roadways in india father of post and telegraph even communication was not there in british india communication was not there but he started the communication network by starting post office hundreds of post office were opened in india the communication channel was open and i will make a very important comment now we by using these post offices only our freedom movement our revolutionaries they started communicating with each other by using the same post office our freedom fighters they use the same postcard same inland letter same uh, telegraph for their communication purpose our entire freedom movement was heavily depending on the postal network post office became the hub of our revolutionary movement all secret information was passed through the postal channel only because they were using a code language our revolutionaries were using a coded language which was not understood by the britishers through that they used to correspondence and even our top leaders uh, one example only i will give you pandit jawarlal nehru if anyone has taken maximum use of uh, post office it is pandit jawarlal nehru because he wrote uh, hundreds of letters to his daughter indira priyadarshini when he was in jail he was in nainital jail almora jail meerat jail uh, tihar jail so when nehru was in jail he used to write letter to his daughter indira priyadarshini and those bunch of letters later on published as a book known as discovery of india that book is called discovery of india it is nothing but the collection of letters by jawarlal nehru to indira gandhi uh, when she was uh, young so why i told this point for you people is this is again the contribution of dalhousie the biggest contribution of dalhousie to india which we have to remember and respect is he laid the railways he built the roads he built the government buildings bridges and provided communication network through post and telegraph and we must be grateful for dalhousie because it helped the freedom movement later may not be not in his time but later on a few decades later our uh, indian freedom movement leaders whether moderates or extremists they heavily depended on these things only for their movements communication and other related activities this is a very important point you have to mention in the answer now i'll come to the last point with which we will conclude the discussion the another contribution of lord dalhousie is introduction of primary school education in india you please note that point introduction of primary school education was started in india by dalhousie and i hope you remember what is the reason for that one report came from england it is called woods dispatch right if you remember the history point you will understand it woods dispatch came to india in 1854 it is called as woods dispatch because sir charles wood was the president of british east india company sir charles wood was president of british east india company and he sent the report dispatch means report so this report 
came to India from London in 1854 and it was Lord Dalhousie who implemented the Woods Report or Woods Dispatch under which a series of primary schools were started in India. Before that, primary schools were not in India. And it was Dalhousie who started the primary schools. He appointed the teachers. He created a department called DPE, Department of Primary Education. And even today the same departments are functioning. And he created a post to head the department. It is called Commissioner for Primary Education. And even today same post is there. Even today we use that designation Commissioner of Public uh, Primary Education. This is a very important uh, game changer in the education system of India. The contribution of Dalhousie is very much for the developing education system in the country. And one historian, Dr. P.C. Sarkar, says, Wood's dispatch is called as Magna Carta of Primary Education in India. I repeat, Dr. P.C. Sarkar says, Wood's dispatch is known as Magna Carta, C-A-R-T-A, Magna Carta of Primary Education in India. So today, whoever is talking about primary education, we must remember and thank Lord Dalhousie for implementing the Woods Dispatch. So in this way, now I will just give a quick summary. The positive impact of the British rule in India, for that question, you have to answer all these things. First I told you, Cornwallis, three points I told you. Number one, land record system, land survey system and a land revenue system. Second thing I told you, judicial reforms of Cornwallis. Third point I told you, civil service, father of civil service in India, contract based thing. Then I discussed about uh, Lord Benting, under Benting, two points I told you, social reforms, abolition of Sati, and second thing, introduction of English education in India, which is a landmark event, and also the Charter Act of 1833 which gave Indians to become officers under the East India Company. Then finally I discussed about Lord Dalhousie, who is called the father of infrastructure in India. He started three departments, railways, PWD and post and telegraph, which is a big game changer in India. And finally I told the contribution of Dalhousie is Woods Dispatch. He implemented the Woods Dispatch and started a primary education system, primary schooling in India and even today we call it as the Magna Carta. And even one more last point you can add there, it is during the time of Lord Dalhousie only, one social reform was done. I hope you know what is that uh, social reform. Widow Remarriage Act was passed, 1854. Widow Remarriage Act was passed by Dalhousie in 1854, which is again a social reform. It is a very good uh, social reform which was badly needed for Hindu society. So with this, I would like to conclude by saying that the positive impact of the East India Company rule on India is very much, very significant and very relevant. And here you have to write only about these three fellows. Cornwallis, Benting and Dalhousie. And deliberately why I did not discuss about Lord Wellesley, I have told you. Because during Wellesley time, no improvement reforms took place. He was more bothered about uh, wars and a subsidiary alliance system and all that. There is no contribution of Wellesley for administration. That's why I have not discussed about Lord Wellesley. But these three people definitely contributed greatly very decisively for changing India in terms of social reforms, administrative reforms, judicial reforms and even economic reforms, infrastructural things, all these things you can say openly, very emphatically that the positive impact of the British rule in India is definitely great and every Indian should be grateful 
for these three people for all the good they have done for India. There is no doubt about it. And uh, in the next uh, discussion, I will come out with the negative follow. This is all the positive way. What is a good thing done? And in the next in my uh, video lecture, I will be explaining you the negative followed. What was the negative impact of the East India Company rule in India? I will discuss in the next session. Uh, thank you and I hope that this discussion will help you in preparing your answers. Thank you.